Good evening and welcome to this special vivid edition of q and I'm Tony Jones, here to answer your questions tonight. The Chief Executive of the CSIRO, Larry Marshall. Cyber psychologist Jocelyn Brewer, who argues for a healthier relationship with technology. Rapper, musician and media entrepreneur Adam Briggs. The co-founder of Australian software giant Atlassian, Mike Cannon-Brooks. And a broadcaster and actor, Faustina Agoli. Please welcome our panel. Thank you. Now, Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio. Tonight's program is a collaboration with Vivid, Sydney's Festival of Light, Music and Ideas, and it will focus on how technology connects and disconnects our society. Our first question is via Skype. It's from Sukant Singh in Springvale, Victoria. Thanks, Tony. Last week's AFP raids at the home of a News Corp journalist and the ABC offices have proved that Australia is, in the words of New York Times, the world's most secretive democracy. There is no doubt that media is not above the law and should not be able to publish anything it come across. But in order to protect journalists, especially investigative journalists, do we need a constitutionally recognized Press Freedom Act? Thank you. Mike Kenneth Brooks, start with you. What do you think? Oh, thanks, Tony. Uh, <laughs> yeah, welcome to <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, I think we do. I think it's it certainly two, two, two big things. Obviously, it was highly concerning to see what happened last week. Twice in one week seemed highly coincidental. Um, the fact that we don't have a legislated freedom of press was a surprise to me, I must say. Um, but it did remind me that we also don't have a Bill of Rights in Australia, which both of which seemed like concerning issues. Um, and it also said that, to me that we should look very carefully at the content of laws. Um, when it said that they had gone in and read data, that's concerning. When it then said that they were allowed to delete or alter data, that was extremely concerning. Well, it was shocking, actually, well, uh, for most journalists, for the ABC people involved, and for anyone looking from the outside. Well, I don't know anything about search warrants, but I'm pretty sure you couldn't turn up to someone's house and alter the contents of their house, mm. plant something, add something, or remove something, and that be a legal thing. So that was incredibly surprising. Think about digital data and being able to add or modify it uh, while inside the offices of the ABC, any journalist or, or any business premises. That seemed shocking is a good word. Seemed Faustina, the, um, it's very concerning for journalists, obviously, and how they carry on their work. But apart from that, this was aimed, obviously, at intimidating potential whistleblowers, um, particularly those who might hold or understand or know government secrets which disturb them. What do you yeah. think? I, uh, I had to look into Annika Smithert's um, career and I, I understand that she's got an incredible legacy in Australia in exposing truths um, and holding people in power accountable. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, her house was raided. Yeah, that's right. And, and in the past, she's been able to call people into power, um, such as Bronwyn Bishop in 2015, um, as well as uh, Susan Lay, who was the, minister, the health minister at the time, um, for spending copious amounts of taxpayer-funded money um, on personal expenses. Um, so she plays an incredible role. Um, my concern is looking into the future is um, how are these journalists going to be protected? It could be a potential situation where international media giants like the New York Times or BBC end up hiring these journalists in the interim and protecting their rights so that they can continue reporting uh, crucial news for, our, for us Australians and to continue to tell the truth. Um, yeah. What do you think about the fate of whistleblowers? Because if, if whistleblowers if find that the journalists who are meant to be protecting their identity and their secrets are under this kind of pressure to give up all their data, uh, data that can be altered or changed, as uh, Mike said, uh, where does that leave them? I think people like Annika are extremely clever and they've worked really, really hard to be in a position that they're in. So um, I don't think that they're going to stop at these threats. I think they, they don't. Um, fold for any kind of intimidation, and I think they're going to keep going. <laughs> yeah, I suspect that's true. Adam, what do you think? I'm not really not trying to draw attention to myself from the AFP. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, they know where you are. Yeah, obviously. They know how to find. <laughs> but um, you know, I, I think it's about protecting the truth and 
protecting honesty and our media. And, you know, but as I said, you know, I'm a rapper. And rappers had a colourful history with the police. So um, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, OK, I'm going to just go to our next question, which is on the same subject, really. It's a video from Terence Hewton in Adelaide. Good evening, panellists. Is it the case that advances in modern technology have brought us to the point where an Orwellian dictatorship is, for the first time in our history, now technically possible? If so, what can we do to protect ourselves against this? Larry Marshall. <laughs> Terence, um, I'm trying to keep a low profile with the AFP too. <laughs> drink, so. um, look, technology offers us some amazing opportunities to, for example, minimise our energy footprint. Now, in order to do this, and Prime Minister Abe in Japan has a plan for this to control the energy usage, transportation and so on, to give us the absolute lowest greenhouse emissions possible. But in exchange for that, we have to give up a, or surrender a certain amount of control. And as a society, we've got to decide for ourselves how much control are we willing to give up to technology. The good news is, at the end of the day, we actually control the technology. The technology doesn't and shouldn't ever control us. Yeah, that's in Australia. Um, and to some degree, people have been arguing that the police have behaved in a kind of Orwellian fashion in this case. But what about a country like China, where there are no rules? Actually, I'm going to go back to your first question. Um, we're sister agencies, CSIRO and, and ABC, and it deeply concerns me when some, the idea of someone messing with data, because mm -hmm. science is the search for truth. We find the data, sometimes we like the answer, sometimes we don't, but we never change the data. It's our job to put the data and the facts on the table so that people can make good decisions. So I worry about the notion of anyone interfering with the pursuit of scientific truth. Someone should be explaining what that meant in the context of these raids, don't you think? I mean, the Federal Police or indeed the Attorney General, because we still don't know. This was in the subpoenas that were issued here. We still don't know what it means. I think Mike did a really eloquent job of explaining it, actually. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I mean... Yeah, he did. He explained what's fearful about it, but he didn't explain why it was in the subpoenas. Um, and that's what the police haven't really described yet. What do you think about a place where the kind of rules that apply here don't apply? And I'm thinking about the kind of Orwellian nature of uh, the use of technology in China. Yeah, and this is the trouble with technology because it, it offers amazing benefits, you know, the, the power to preserve and prolong life. And as scientists, we always think about the good aspects of technology, how we can embrace it to make life better. But unfortunately, every technology has a, a downside to it. Again, it's up to us as a society to decide how best to use technology. That's why I'm really proud the government picked CSIRO to work on the ethics framework for artificial intelligence. I think that's a really great responsibility for us and a great example of how we can really as a society, decide what we want technology to do and what we want it not to do in our lives. Uh, Jocelyn, I'll come to you in a minute, but I just want to throw that back to uh, Mike and the, the idea there should be some sort of ethical framework around artificial intelligence. Um, in China, where they have a social credit system that measures every stroke, every social media um, statement that you put out and judge you as a citizen against it, um, is that in any way ethical from your point of view? Look, I think from an Australian context, we would argue that that's not ethical and not something we would want to have uh, in our society, right? Uh, I think what Larry's trying to say, which is important, is we... Um, firstly, we need, we need a, a populace that's educated in these issues. They're, they're complicated, scientific, technological. You get to encryption, you get all AI, these, these scary-sounding terms, and people just turn off. And without the education, we're not going to uh, uh, vote... Um, in some way for the correct sorts of rules that we want to have as a society. Um, and then you end up with very scary bills and things that sort of start piling up. And uh, you need examples like the AFP to perhaps highlight some of these things, but then you also need changes to happen. So it is up to us with AI to decide what is OK and not OK. We're not going to sort of slow down the march of technology in a global level, mm. but we can still choose to some extent what's allowed and not allowed in Australia. We're going to come back to that question a little later in more detail. Jocelyn, what do you think? Uh, we're talking freedom of the press, we're talking about the Orwellian nature of control. It sounds a lot like a Black Mirror episode. <laughs> yeah. um, 
Uh, to me, what strikes um, a chord, I guess, is the, the intimidation nature of it as well, that it, it shows up a little bit like bullying. And we work really hard in this country to make sure that young people stand up against bullying and, and kind of report the things that are going on like this. So I think the message around whistleblowers and, and feeling like you can be protected and, and be heard is really important. And, and certainly um, without having some of those protections there, it's quite... It's a scary place, you know. I, I think we're still coming to terms with the fact that every time you go into a social media site and you tick, you know, terms and conditions, they're the sorts of things that, you know, we're saying yes to and we're giving this information away. So this sort of brings that home, that the way that's, you know, almost all information is lacking protection sometimes and that can be not a great thing. Let's move on to our next question. It's from Casper uh, Jeffrey. Thanks, Tony. Uh, the assistance and access laws passed late last year have given law enforcement the ability to serve people and companies in the tech sector with requests that undermine the security of services and applications that we all use. For refusing to comply or even disclosing the request, jail time can be enforced. Should Australian software engineers and companies be worried? Mike Cannon-Brooks, obviously a question for you. You've commented on this already uh, in the past, but um, how much damage could this do? Uh, yeah, Casper, great question and well put. Um, it, can, it can do a lot of damage. Um, it, it, uh, I mean, everything Casper said is true and we should be uh, uh, very cautious and to some extent a little bit fearful about its potential. Um, I, I think that the damage, the main damage done to the Australian tech sector is on a PR perspective, to be honest. Um, it, it is, you know, sort of globally uh, a little bit of a joke of a piece of legislation, but we have to live with it. What it means is any consumer around the world that's looking at two pieces of technology, two apps, two choices, is going to be less likely to choose the Australian one because of the fear that someone's looking at their data, someone's looking into their... Into that their someone has software. put a back door into the software so that uh, intelligence services or police can get into Intelligence services, police. I mean, we've already seen uh, a number of new departments request access under this bill. So it started with six or seven departments, I think, and it's kind of growing. Um, and that's the problem is when you get these laws that are passed that are uh, overly broad. Um, and if you look at the, the access, access encryption bill, one of the particulars of that is, is there's very loose definitions of a whole series of these terms. And laws with loose definitions are extremely dangerous because they will be used and interpreted differently five years from now. So it's great when the government says, oh, no, but we didn't really mean that. Well, that doesn't mean anything if you've passed a law that has, has these sort of broad interpretations. But what do you say to the government when the security agencies have advised them that this is all about catching bad guys, terrorists, before they do something really terrible? So sure. we need to get into the encrypted data that they are using to communicate, and we need the cooperation of companies like yours to do it. That's the argument they will make. Sure. Uh, I would say a few things. Firstly, um, we said this had to be passed before Christmas, yet it had a 30-day cooling-off period and was passed less than 30 days before Christmas. So that can't have been true. Two, we say this law is all about terrorism, 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 terrorism. The minimum crime is three years. You can have bad traffic offences and be caught up in this bill. So when they say it's about terrorism, then make it 15 years. Make it, you know, whatever sort of these... You know, you can change some of the specificities quite, um, quite easily for that to be the case. Uh, and they, they chose not to do that. So... Look, we, it was rushed through. Uh, I think it was very broadly written and we are uh, continually hopeful that it will be amended and changed. One final uh, quick question before I move around the panel. But uh, could a company like yours be targeted by international competitors who'd be saying to the market, you can't trust this Australian software uh, because of this legislation, so buy ours instead? Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, we've already seen examples of customers asking these questions. Competitors will use that against us. Um, and again, don't forget, this is supposed to be about communication tools, but communication tools or communication providers are defined so broadly that we're caught up uh, all sorts of... Basically, any website you use is effectively caught up in this legislation. Again, defined, I would argue, far too broadly for what they were trying to achieve, which is not a, not a bad goal in the first place. And I understand that laws, look, they're really challenging to move ahead with technology. Technology moves quite fast. This is a very hard thing for the government to do. But, you know, we've seen in the UK a different example, a similar type of issue, 12-week consultation period, um, you know, very sort of open process and getting a lot of input into the bill. There, there was no consultation on this bill at all. Right? Uh, 
Let me throw it to Larry. Are you concerned for Australian tech companies that they could be put at a competitive disadvantage? Um, I, I think the problem is um, similar in all countries, and I should explain. At, at the moment, we have polymorphic um, viruses that are the, the digital analogue of, of biological viruses that mutate. Um, and they change very fast, or as Mike said, they, 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 they change exponentially. So it's very, very hard to keep up with and defend um, organisations against those intrusions. And they're the sort of technologies that are used by so-called black hats. So I guess what I worry about, um, it's, that, it's that delicate tension between being able to protect ourselves against the black hats without interfering with the individual rights of privacy or um, the competitive advantages of Australian or US or European companies. I think all countries are dealing with this sort of, sort of tension. Does it look to you that this law was rushed through without sufficient consideration of the impact it would have? I, 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 think, it's, I think it's a very complex, it's a very complex technical, technological environment, which means it's very hard to quickly do a, a, a law to deal with it. And we need more time, I think, to get our arms around it. So I wouldn't say necessarily it was rushed, but because of the nature of technology changing exponentially, you set the law today, it probably needs to change a few days from today to deal with the fact that technology has progressed so, so rapidly. I'm going to quickly move on to another subject. Remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, let us know on Twitter. I'm not saying that was one. Uh, keep an eye on the RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Conversation website for the results. The next question comes from Grace Heffron. My questions for Adam Briggs are if the national anthem was to change, what would it have to look like in order to be accepted by the Indigenous community? Well, thanks for your question. But um, to, to change the national anthem, um, like when we're talking about the, the video I did the other week, what I was presenting to... Australia was basically a scoreboard because um, a group of football players had said um, that they weren't going to sing. And so I presented uh, uh, a video like, with a list of the disadvantage and why the national anthem doesn't represent. You took individual phrases from the anthem and you gave yeah. your interpretation of how those phrases look to you as an Indigenous person. Yeah, and because I haven't stood for the anthem since I was, you know, maybe 13 or 14 years old. So to change the anthem and what it would have to include, it's about acknowledgement for Indigenous people and our place in Australia as the first people of Australia, being here for 60,000 plus years and also, you know, the oldest, you know, continuing civilization on the face of the earth. Like, that's not something that I feel is truly acknowledged by Australia. I feel like it's delivered lip service. Adam, what, just take a couple, for anyone who hasn't seen the video, take a couple of lines or examples from within the anthem that, that mean something to people who sing it, say, blindly or have sung it without really thinking about it, but means something very different to you. Um, well... You know, the, the idea that Australia is young and free when Indigenous people are some of the most incarcerated people on the face of the earth. Um, you know, wealth for toil and only one in ten Indigenous Australians are financially secure. And they're just like, you know, it's, it's really quick, it's really hard to, to break down such a, a vast and sophisticated issue into a three-minute bit of comedy, you know what I mean, for, for what I did. But it... But it was, re it was it, actually... It, it, was, it, it, it was really telling to look at it because it's a, like almost every phrase has a different meaning for you yeah. uh, than for, let's say, a bunch of white kids singing it at school. Well, I don't... Like, when I was you know, getting delivered the anthem, because, like, that's what happened. I was in primary school, and they deliver you this anthem, and that's your song, and you sing it, and you don't ask questions why, because everyone else is. You know, so I don't think, uh, you know, a lot of people are that um, attached 
mm. to the actual anthem. It's only, you know, 35 years old. I don't think anyone is really that attached to it because the song's just not that good. <laughs> <laughs> Sometime maybe you should have a crack at writing a better one. Yeah, well, Paul Kelly could do it. He's all right. <laughs> Dan Salton. Paul and Dan. Yeah. Um, so were you proud of those uh, young uh, footballers who, yeah. who, who remained silent, decided not to sing? Um, and even though some commentators said, oh, maybe it affected the way they played, um, in fact, there were players on both sides who... What affected the way they played was Queensland. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I love the boys. And they, what they did was strong and it was it was staunch but it was it was also very calm and telling of you know their responsibility to their communities as well and what they did was was fantastic and it was it was something to be proud of and i think it not just for the indigenous communities and their respective communities it's it's a moment that australia can reflect on and be proud of Faustina, what do you think? And do you do you think this not singing it might catch on? Um, that other groups of people might stop singing the anthem. Um, it's obviously a, quite a controversial thing if that happens. Well, quite possibly because every social movement starts with um, people standing up and speaking out, like public figures like Briggs, and then it moves to protest and boycott, and then eventually there is structural change from the top down. That's how the cycle works. So it wouldn't surprise me if it does catch on. What do you think, Mike? Could we use a new anthem for a whole variety of reasons? Um. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out exactly what Gert by C means myself. <laughs> I, I think, look, uh, look, I think obviously we have a, a fairly shameful history when it comes to Indigenous communities and, uh, as Briggsy mentioned, like incarceration rates, but also health outcomes and educational outcomes and all sorts of things. So... I guess I wouldn't want it to distract from those bigger, bigger issues, but if it is a step towards doing those things, I'm not particularly attached to the anthem. I could get behind you. I, I totally agree with your point earlier, by the way, which was, I think, glossed over. I, I watched your video, mate, and I thought, wow, I've been singing this for 39 years. He's totally right. Like, this made a lot of sense. It changed the way I thought about the anthem just in watching the video, which I think is, is powerful. That's what, that's what great art should do, right? It made you think about it and... and certainly changed my opinion, so do I think we can change everybody in the country? I, I think we, we've got a chance. Of course. Well, and the, yeah, and like, there, are, there are bigger issues, like with our health outcomes mm -hmm. and incarceration and, you know, but my whole approach with, with these kinds of things, like if we can't change the simple things, the small things, like what hope is there to change the bigger stuff? If mm -hmm. we can't take the steps towards changing the simple things, like a bad song... <laughs> a bad song, why can't, you know, how, how do we move forward to change, you know, everything else? Like, it, it doesn't feel like, like an, an honest dynamic, you know, from Australia with Indigenous people if we can't do those small things. You know that some, pe some people are going to take umbrage with that and suggest it's actually a really big thing. Um, so... Uh, 35 people... years old, get over it. <laughs> <laughs> We've been Just... here for 60,000 years. We had better songs. <laughs> um, I think we need the trifecta. I think we need to change the anthem. I think we need to change the date. And I think we need a treaty. Just hang on for a sec, because I'm going to hold you up there for a moment while we just go to our next question, because you've almost anticipated some elements of it. It's from Lisa Horan. As a descendant of what you might call traditional white Australians, my Celtic ancestors were dispossessed by the same people that dispossessed Indigenous Australians. In this, we share some common ground. I support possible changes to the flag and the national anthem, but not changing Australia Day. However, I believe that we should be united in respecting the current flag and anthem for as long as they are in place. Why can't we ever seem to build on our common ground and move forward together? I'll come back to you, Jocelyn, because I cut you off. Um, I think because we're not recognising enough of what has gone before, I don't think we've sort of spent time to unpack things like what 
do we sing mindlessly? Um, I can tell you that Peter Dogs McCormack, who wrote the national anthem, is buried in Rookwood Cemetery because I grew up near there. I have some kind of connection to it, but I don't think many people do. And I think we should start with kind of unpacking some of those things and, and thinking and really, really coming to terms with what that looks like in our communities, um, you know, around Australia. So... It, they're big issues and I know that they're very, very emotionally driven and everybody has a story, but sometimes we need to stop and look back at the big ones that we've really interrupted and the generations of trauma that we've, um, yeah, created. Larry, what do you think? Oh, an anthem and a flag are, are intended to unite people. And let's face it, the world has so many problems that we have to navigate. We need a Team Australia approach more than we have any other time in history. So if our anthem and our flag aren't uniting us, let's figure out how to solve that. And, and by the way, science does prove um, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are the oldest living culture on the planet, so it really doesn't make a lot of sense to call our country young. We should be proud of the fact that we have the oldest living continuous culture in the world. Do you, do you suspect in that case that the anthem is unintentionally uh, biased or even racist? Um, I, I think all of us are um, subject to unconscious bias. Um, I'm a male champion of change, and a, and a huge part of what we do to deal with gender um, equality is to, is to kind of unpick the things that we were taught as children, the things that we were taught in school, the things we didn't even know we were being taught. These are unconscious biases. And I think it takes the greatest of goodwill, patience and understanding on all sides of the debate to resolve those so that we, we, we can move forward um, as a, as a country. Adam, do you want to reflect on the question that was asked? Because um, the suggestion is maybe some things should change, but until they do, they should be respected. Well, I think, I mean, every, um, you know, idea that I present with respect, the adversity that I face, I, I face with a great deal of respect. Um, you know... To compare Indigenous disadvantage to any other disadvantage in Australia is is vastly like it's it's crazy to me because you know up until I could say you know the eighties you know my parents got turned away from home ownership. They had the deposit, but as soon as the person who was selling the house found out that they were Indigenous, that house was no longer for sale. And that was the 80s. The disadvantage that we face is still today. It's still here. It hasn't left us. We still wear it. We still wear it in, in all of our communities. Some of the communities that we have in Australia are third world and we're one of the richest countries. That is insanity. You heard uh, Mike's reaction to seeing your uh, video and your take on the anthem and sort of rethinking it from your perspective. Have you generally had a kind of respectful response or has it been the kickback? I, I always get the kickback, man. Like, that's, that's just part of... That's just showbiz, baby. That's just <laughs> part of it, you know what I mean? Like, that's just what happens. Like, people come back at me you know, like, tenfold. I've got a manager and one of his jobs is deleting the racist comments every day. Every day, and it's a big job. I probably need two managers. <laughs> but the message is so much more important. The message is, is, is bigger than me as well. You know, I'm from Shepparton, Victoria. I'm a Yorta Yorta man. And I know I can go home because I know what my values are and I know you know, the choices I make and my morals uh, are just and they reflect my community. That's why I get to do the things I do. So people's backlash to me, it doesn't fly because I know who I am and I know where I'm from. Faustina, do you want to reflect on the question that was asked, which is essentially, um, yeah, maybe some things should change, but we should do it in a different way and we should respect the anthem and... We shouldn't change Australia Day, I think the questioner suggested. Uh, but if we're going to change the flag and the anthem, we should respect the flag and the anthem until they're changed. OK, 
Okay. <laughs> I think, I think in, in this process we really do need to listen to our Aboriginal, our Indigenous leaders. We need to listen to people like Briggs. We need to listen to people like Marsha Langton. Um, uh, and the, the list of, goes on in terms of the, the, the leaders that we can turn to. Um, I don't think that me being a migrant to this country, I can impose an, a particular idea as to how this country should and its symbols should, should be represented when there is a culture that is 60,000 years old that has been, you know, been uh, screaming for equality for 230 years and are wanting particular rights. Um, so I don't think that I should be imposing my opinion on that. If anything, I just agree. <laughs> I think as well, it's like, you know, change doesn't come from being comfortable. Exactly. I have to make myself uncomfortable and wear a lot of that stuff to be able to, to shift, you know, these ideas and move these things. I have to make myself uncomfortable to make everybody else uncomfortable so they start talking about change doesn't come when everybody's comfortable. That's a good point to uh, leave that subject. You're watching a special vivid Q&A looking towards the future. Our next question comes from Tara Hodge. Hey, yeah. So, in the heavily filtered and image-obsessed world of social media, with its doctored pictures and staged lifestyles, it's easy to be fooled into thinking everyone always looks perfect, are always having fun and living perfect lives. As the mother of a young daughter, I am concerned about the impact this can have on young girls especially, on self-esteem, body image and mental health. What kind of strategies do you think that we can take as parents or a community to minimise the potential for harm? Jocelyn, your special subject. Yeah, um, I'm a mum of a two-year-old as well, or a little girl as well, and I constantly am asked questions around how we have kind of a healthy um, relationship with technology and we scroll more healthy habits, I guess, um, more healthy hashtags. So some of the strategies that I really think we need to um, put into place is teaching media literacy and digital literacy so that young people understand that a lot of what shows up in your social media feed is not real life um, and that real life is probably not that Instagrammable and not really something that we want to be looking at all the time. Um, I think Celeste Barber does a really great, um, you know, uh, has her account is really great for kind of taking a reality check on that. Um, so that's that's a really key thing, and we, we don't in Australia. I know ABC last year did a really great um, media literacy challenge, and there's a, it's quite piecemeal and fragmented around how we actually teach some of those strategies um, to to unpack the the information that's shown to us through the feeds. What's the most unhealthy aspect, from your point of view, of social media, the way it's used, and uh, we heard about young women, the effect it has on body image on many aspects actually of yeah. life. I think the big thing that I see is the vanity metrics. So the chasing the follower numbers, the likes and, and those sorts of just basic numbers, big numbers, um, rather than looking at who's following you and the quality of the relationships that you have with those people in the community that you can build through social media. So getting away from some of those things. And, and the irony is that we blame young people for being obsessed with those metrics whereas the media is really driven by that. Um, we see a lot of brands saying, yay, we've got, you know, 6,000 followers and all of those sorts of things, and it's in direct comparison to really what we want young people to be um, valuing. Uh, th there's a lot of research that shows we can't have deep and meaningful relationships with 7,000 people, you know. Maybe seven, you know. Who are the people that you can call when you're in a really tricky spot. They're the kinds of relationships we want to be fostering and recognising that our friends online are really just people who are um, kind of creeping out on us sometimes, not in the most healthy way. Falsina, what do you think? Um, I wholeheartedly agree with you, Jocelyn. I think um, allowing your children to be more transparent online will cultivate more transparency amongst their peers and your friends. Um, and uh, the way that we can engage in social media. There's still pockets where people are keeping it real, are talking about their mental health struggles, are talking about body issues and things like that. And I think that that's a much healthier space to be engaging in. They're there. They're there. I'm going to move on to our next question. It's on the same subject, but it'll take us in a slightly different direction. It's from Dan Ryan. 
Yeah, I grew up with my uh, screen time heavily regulated by my parents, and I've heard I've heard talk of these uh, screen-free nannies, which are ironically popular with Silicon Valley kids and and the wealthy. What are the repercussions for a childhood in front of screens, um, and are they felt most acutely by the poor? Yeah, Jocelyn, I'll start with you again. Oh, that is a really good question. Um, and probably yes is the answer, that um, a lot of the time when we have conversations about going offline or um, other choices away from screens, um, they do tend to be with people who can afford alternative strategies to that. Um, you know, going offline, I guess, is the new luxury. Uh, if you're working in the gig economy or you're relying cheap on your luxury, phone. Um, actually, you just have to stop. Well, you know, but is it when a lot of young people's um, learning is connected yeah. to their devices and this idea that, you know, smartphones are the devil's work and um, laptops for learning are these perfectly, you know, pristine spaces where kids have never, ever hacked a firewall to play a game that they shouldn't on their school BYOD. Um, so... It's a very tricky and complex question because we are using screen time as this single metric for measuring the good or the bad within um, what we're doing online rather than looking at the activities that we're doing online, the kind of collaboration. So you can, you can use that metric uh, for measuring, for example, if Absolutely. someone might be addicted to gaming. Um, um, and, and there's now a new... Metric yeah. for that from the WHO. There, there is a, a gaming uh, disorder classification, but it's actually not based on excessive use. It's a based on how um, the negative impact on your life. So no researchers can come up with exactly what excessive use means. We know that we, we have, you know, these discrete and very rounded numbers like one hour or two hours for kids between um, 5 and 17 of non-educational screen time. Now, I, my question is... Why isn't educational uses of screen time included? And why don't adults have screen time as well? Because if it's, it's just one metric, though. I think we really need to look at it like counting calories. Uh, we, we need to do more like look at the virtual vitamins that sit within the different um, activities that we participate in. So it's really different if you're, for instance, tweeting along to Q&A versus maybe tweeting along to a reality TV show we could, you know, look at the differences in, in those two activities. And again, some young people who are maybe playing violent video games that are R-rated versus playing serious or indie games that might have a better pro-social sort of narrative and purpose to the game. So I might come back to you on that gaming issue um, a little later. But, uh, Mike, I mean, the Silicon Valley thing, obviously, um, you know, you've got a, a way of looking at that, which is... Um, you know, there are these internet entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. There's uh, Belinda Gates, not Silicon Valley, but Melinda and Bill Gates and, um, and um, Steve Jobs. They all were very strict with their children about screen time, about the use of smartphones. Uh, they set limits, strict limits. Do they know something we don't know? Uh, look, it's, it's a complicated issue, I think, as, as, as Jocelyn put it. Um, I'm always asked what we do. And, and the first thing I always say is, look, I've got four kids, uh, two, four, six and eight, and my wife and I, you know, we... Look, I'll tell you, in 20 years, if we did a good job, <laughs> firstly. <laughs> so we, claiming expertise or giving up parenting advice is really hard. Um, but secondly, we, we try to be... I think that this, if I had to distill it down to one thing, it's try to be a good role model, right? So I get home about 6 o'clock and try to put the phone away until the kids are in bed so they're not looking at me, looking at the phone all the time, right? Mm. Are we perfect? No. Mm. Do we try really hard to be good? Yes. Do we try to have good conversations with the kids about what they're using, why they're using it, etc.? cetera? Um, uh, again, I don't phrase as eloquently as Jocelyn does, but screen time as an absolute value doesn't make sense to me. I agree with that. If they're playing Minecraft versus an extremely violent video game or if they're doing, I don't know, reading eggs or things that my kids do versus... You know, there, there's a huge difference in that, right? Um, if you're watching 30 minutes a day of YouTube, you know, people opening toys, uh, that's too much. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, you know, it's hard. We, we all survive through various things. I had a lot of technology growing up at various points in my household, but, you know, went outside and kicked the footy just the same and I think as long as kids are getting a healthy balance of things... Um, so Bill Gates, Melinda Gates, um, stopped their kids having cell phones and smartphones until the age of 14. I don't know why they pick that, pick that particular age, but uh, do you think you'll have similar rules? 
Uh, look, my eldest is eight, um, and he does not have a smartphone. I, I, I don't think he needs a smartphone for a fair while. I don't know if 14 is the age, but it seems a sensible enough proxy. Look, we'll cross that bridge. We've got a long time to get there. What do you think, Larry? Well, I was babysitted by ABC when I was young, so Doctor Who, The Goodies, um, Q&A wasn't on then, but in any event. Can I go to the po Dan, can I go to the positive side of this? So, so one of the things that CSIRO is concerned about is, is wellness. We have 11 million Australians who are suffering from chronic disease. And what we've discovered that social media um, and apps have a way of changing human behaviour to keep more people well to prevent them from getting the disease in the first place. We've got an app uh, called We Feel, um, which is about dealing with loneliness. So if you like taking the, the positive side of digital, we've used digital technology to reach into very remote communities that can't get good quality health care and through augmented reality and virtual reality give them top quality care that they'd normally have to come into the city for. So there's a positive side to this technology story. Again, as a society, I think we have the power to, to choose the positive of these technologies to make life better for all of us. Got another question on this. I'm going to go to it. Isabel uh, Kikirikov, sorry. <laughs> In light of concerns for the impact that social media platforms have on our health, could we see a mass social media rebellion? Adam, what do you think? And I actually wonder whether you're tempted to throw away social media completely when you see the amount of trolling... <laughs> Um, that you were talking about, having to have a manager go through your own social media accounts? Yeah, um, I think, like, social media for me has been really great. Um, I got to work with Matt Groening from The Simpsons because uh, a producer talked to me on Twitter, mm. you know, so I got a job. And that worked out really good. But, the, you know, the other side of it is it can be... Uh, a pretty dark place for, especially for young kids. Like, I see a lot of trolls and um, a lot of people didn't really believe um, the kind of messages I was getting. So I used to screenshot them and throw them up and, and put them on blast. Um, I don't do it anymore because, like, I realise I've got a lot of young, like, fans, like, you know, young kids that who might not be built like me, who, who can't handle that. Mm. So It's like, interesting, you know, we, there's a story today about Greg Inglis, the great uh, rugby league player, and uh, there's been trolling of his five-year-old five kid, yeah. um, which is totally shocking. You know, it's racist, yeah. um, without doubt. But they have decided, he and his wife, to remain engaged because to, uh, to give up uh, would be even worse mm. in their view. Yeah, well, you know, that's, that's Greg's... Greg's choice and and Greg's a champion and Greg's a strong dude and um, you know everyone's choice you know with social media it, it, it's going to come down to the person and whether or not they they can handle it you know because it mm. it does get pretty dark as you said like that's a five year old kid and people that people are trolling mm. like like what kind of individual or human does that yeah. but you know, when it comes to me, like, the way I look at it is, you know, those aren't real things. Like, those aren't real comments. They aren't real people. Because not one of them, you know, come up to me in the street and say mm. anything mm. on the street. Yeah. He's a little bit bigger off the internet. Mm. So they, I get handshakes and I get asked for photos. So the odds are that there's going to be some of those trolls around too. So, you know, the way that you handle it is, is, a personal, is a personal thing. So, you know, I felt like, you know, I was putting, you know, maybe, you know, a bit of cross-contamination in my social media element because I was leaving those comments up that kids didn't need to see. Mm. That was my choice. So I took it down. I stopped doing it. You know what I mean? That was just my choice. Just to take you back to the question, do you get, can you ever imagine uh, a time when a lot of young people um, say, look, it's a lot cooler not to be part of this Facebook 
uh, system yeah. or any of the other, Instagram, whatever. Um, so it's actually, um, we could actually do things in a different way. Um, we could relate to each other face to face, for example. So what to what? Yeah. yeah. Um, look, I think there is a bit of a backlash and, and some of this comes down to the, 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 I think the question was around loneliness too, how we're feeling sort of disconnected despite all of our friends and all of the accounts and all of the things that we put up and we share, we do feel a little bit disconnected and lonely. Um, there is a movement for kids and, and all of us, I think, to have changed our um, posting habits and how we share and who we, how, how we use it basically to create those face-to-face -face connections again. Um, so a supplement to our connections and our relationships rather than the central part to that. Um, there, I mean, I, I, I go on and off social media all the time in my own little experiments and sometimes it's a really lonely place because when you're not pushing stuff out and people aren't vicariously experiencing your day or your hilarious toddler doing things, then they kind of don't notice when you're not there. And so it's become this... It's just a really strange way, I guess, that we're communicating and, and I go back to using it to create the event, my backyard kind of barbecue, to say, come around and let's hang out. Let's do what we did in 1997. Faustina. It's interesting that we're talking... Back to the future. <laughs> Love barbecues. But I, I, it's interesting that we are talking about um, having uh, like social media making us lonely, whereas, I mean, through the lens of somebody who identifies as LGBTQIA+, or queer, um, I'm a lesbian, um, these platforms, these social media platforms are actually vital for connection, especially for people of colour, um, and this is the way that people can connect. And I think about young people who are in a family where they feel like a complete minority or feel completely lonely in their community, and uh, their ability to engage with an online community of potentially trans kids globally to find shared common ground, shared stories and to feel a part of something. So I think it's, it's, it's really, really powerful. Yes, there are days that I cannot stand Instagram and yes, there are days that I, I put things on pause, but it's always going to be there for me to connect with, with the real deal people. Plus, you might end up getting a job in the Simpsons writing room. Well, Ava DuVernay has followed me on Twitter, so that's pretty dope. Very good. Um, OK, the next question, different subject, uh, from Colin Lee. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, Mike Cannon-Brooks, you once tweeted that the best way to fight climate change is to treat it like business. And you also believe that um, renewable energy sources such as solar and wind energy or power could replace Australia's $70 billion coal industry. My question is for the panel, um, where do things stand now and what should our government and our country's innovation vision look like in the near future? Thank we'll, you. We'll start with you, Mike. Uh, thanks, Colin. Uh, where do things stand now? Um, good question. Um, Especially after well, the North Queensland backlash. Well, uh, uh, we had, look, the, the Minister for Emissions Reduction celebrated his first week uh, by putting out our emissions numbers that have gone up for the fourth year in a row. So, uh, uh, fantastic, great move, well done Angus, because that was a good start to his uh, career as a Minister for Emissions Reduction. Um, I think, look, as you mentioned with the election, we're probably not going to see a lot of political change in the next few years when it comes to climate change. Uh, and that's not just energy, although that's the biggest sector of our emissions, right? With agriculture, transportation, there's a whole series of uh, sectors we have to look at to uh, um, make change as such an existential issue. Um, we, you know, we're going to need corporates. So, you know, Atlassian, uh, uh, we've joined this group called RE100 to uh, pledge to go 100% renewable, uh, which is not a simple challenge. Three and a half thousand staff, seven different countries, ten different offices. Um, we now have three of the top 25 companies in Australia have joined the RE100. Um, so you're seeing corporations realise not only is this a huge um, uh, moral issue, it's a huge financial issue for them, it's a huge ethical issue. So three of Australia's top 25 companies have now said they're going to go 100% renewable. So you're going to see corporate sector have to take a lot more control, I think, and a lot more charge of the issue. Mm -hmm. um, you're pretty hooked into global markets. Um, yep. The question was about the replacement of the coal industry. Um, where, where is coal going from your perspective? Um, oh, it's going away. 
Uh, <laughs> quite simply. Look, I mean, it depends on the protection you look at. 15 Even massive years. markets still in China, in India? What do you... China and India are both peaking in their coal usage. They've had massive run-ups in the last five to ten years. Um, you see that already tailing off in China. Uh, I think it's going to continue. I mean, coal's future as an energy source, um, 15, 25 years, it doesn't matter. If you're from Australia, and I think it's a $70 billion industry for us, it's a massive, massive industry, and it's going away. Call it 50 years. We should be planning for that now, right? We need to plan people's transition and their, their jobs, their livelihoods. We need to plan our economic transition. Uh, we can't just stick our head in the sand and assume it's not going to happen. Or if you're right about the curve up. of uh, demand in China and India, uh, what happens when the curve goes down the other side? It's pretty brutal for us because I think what you'll see is uh, China and India will naturally prop up their local coal market. They'll support a local coal producer. That will not be good for us. Um, so you won't see... Uh, the the long-term future for that as an energy source is, is not good, um, which is an economic issue for us. Put climate change aside for a second, which is sort of insane to say. Mm. From a company point of view as Australia, we, we have a huge economic problem there um, and we need to do something about that. We have a lot of po possibilities, but denying it's going to happen is, is the worst possible strategy. Larry, what do you think about that? We need a plan. So um, there is a global um, market. So we don't have a plan currently? There's a, there's a, actually, CSRO has three plans. Um, I mean but, the government. <laughs> <laughs> well, like ABC, CSRO is independent of the government, but yep. we have three plans um, for, the, for the energy transition. The, the problem, as Mike said, if you add up coal, LNG and iron ore, because without coal you can't make steel out of iron ore, it's, it's $160 billion of export revenue. More importantly, it's a third of all corporate tax paid in the country. So the taxes that pay for health care, um, education, social services. So, so we can't lose that tax base. We need something to replace it, but at the same time, there's a global market trend away. So CSIRO has been working on some breakthrough um, science <laughs> technology something I prepared earlier. <laughs> we, we, think, we think one option is this um, device which we call the hydrogen cracker. Turn it on. So basically... <laughs> <laughs> from the Doctor Who's Not there, in the <laughs> But basically, um, you can put a liquid fuel, ammonia, which has no carbon in it and therefore no emissions, you can pump a liquid fuel inside this and get pure hydrogen out the other side. So it's literally a seamless transition from ammonia to hydrogen. You can use all of the liquid fuel infrastructure around the world. You can fill a ship with ammonia, ship it, for example, to Japan, and then use it there as a purely 100% renewable fuel. And we invested in this because we think it could go some of the way to replacing the fossil fuel exports and paying the taxes that we need. Larry, uh, uh, you got something else in your pocket, have you? You know, this I, is like Parliament. <laughs> I, 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 I might, you I might snuck have. Them on board. I might yeah, have. You know, we talk about solar panels, and, and the solar cell design that's being shipped by China all around the world was actually invented in Australia. So I'd kind of like to do something a bit different a homegrown solar cell that we can produce here through 3D printing oh, cool. rather than buying it in from overseas. Now, look, I'm, I'm not a close the gate person, but when you've got this massive export revenue, you need to replace it with something in order to continue to grow our economy. So CSIRO's plan has us going to carbon neutral without derailing the economy. And that's the, that's the important thing. That's the challenge we're trying to solve. Larry, I'm bound to ask you the obvious question, which is that the CSIRO was given vast sums of money to, pro to produce clean coal um, technology. And um, that happened under the Howard government. It was uh, more money to create an institute uh, to do that uh, under the Rudd government. Um, is there any such thing as clean coal so, so technology? Look, if, if we have a lot of coal, and if you could use science to do the impossible, the seemingly impossible, and turn coal into something that didn't emit greenhouse gases, we would do it. I will tell you, we have created a version of coal that has 30% less emissions than a gasoline engine. So that's a great step, but it's not zero, whereas hydrogen, we believe, can go to zero. I'll give you one more. Have I, can I do one more? You have to be quick. You'll give it's, you it's really quick. So the cattle industry is 10% is 10 of Australia's emissions. We invented a feed supplement that eliminates all greenhouse gas emissions, virtually eliminates them from cattle. So it's, it, it takes so you're saying it takes away flatulence. Um, <laughs> they actually, Tony, they actually, it's belching. How's burp and fart? Oh, they really belching. do. Belching. So do humans. That's another common part mis of flatulence. Common misconception.
I think, yeah. I think flatulence covers burpees. There's a cover burpee. I think, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have a cow in my bag, no. Uh, Adam, I think you want to jump in there, but I'm not sure why. No, I was just looking at all these gadgets. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to jump to our next question, which is from Gary Jones. Gary. So this is a question for Larry and for Mike. According to the 2018 Global Innovation Index, of the 126 countries studied, Australia ranked number 20 on the global scale for inventiveness, due largely to work done by the CSIRO. But when it comes to translating that inventiveness to real products, Australia ranks number 76, leaving two-thirds of the world in front of us. What can we do to, um, to reverse this disparity? Um, no, I'm not going to let you have another go. With <laughs> uh, I'll start with Mike. Um, it, it is a pretty um, <coughs> terrible statistic. Um, we, we manage to invent things, but we don't know how to uh, um, sell them. Maybe not true in the software industry. Yeah, I was going to say, like in the technology industry, if I start there, uh, we bat well above our weight, right? Um, you know, we've created three and a half thousand jobs. Um, there are many companies in technology over the last 10 years, and Australia's done really, really well in our tech industry over the last 10 years at commercialising. Um, uh, incidentally, we add more jobs every quarter than Adani is proposing to create in total. So it's one example of one company, and there's many more like us. Uh, However, as a... We should move to North Queensland and solve everyone's problems. Well, we're looking for remote workers all over Australia, so mm -hmm. uh, send in your CVs. Um, <laughs> we do, we do commercialise technology historically very badly, right? Um, and part of that, I think, comes down to R&D investment, fundamentally. Like, our corporate R&D investment is... Can you explain R&D? Because I didn't know what R&D was yesterday. So our research and development. Companies that choose to spend money uh, for every $100 they have to spend, how much do they spend on trying to create new things versus customer service versus sales, marketing, all the other things they have to do. They have to create something, some fundamental science. Think of Larry's uh, friends in lab coats. Um, and we spend about one point, a bit less than 1.9% of GDP on corporate research and development, right? Which sounds like a lot, almost 2% of GDP. It's almost a half a percent less than the OECD average. So we're almost in the bottom quartile for corporate and government R&D spending. So you think it should be like 3 or 4%? 3% uh, would be good. As a lot of, I think Britain has a goal of getting to 3%, about 2.5% or so. Um, and, and it's, you know, we, we just need to do as a corporate and government, you know, the government's cut R&D spending, they cut Larry's budget quite significantly, which he could have had a lot more props. Um, <laughs> but it, we, we've, we've got to get a, a mentality in Australia of spending, you know, spending corporate resources, spending government resources on research and development, right? It's been shown that economies that spend more money on research and development generate more new jobs and are able to handle technology transformations, of which we get one every five or ten years, much more effectively. Like, they're more resilient to shocks because they're able to do this. And let's, let's, uh, let's go to Larry. Um, we're, we're running out of time, but um, so no more uh, use of the props. You might want to show us one of them which could actually be produced into a commercial property quickly. <laughs> um, but here's the thing. Um, why the disparity? That was the question. It, it's our culture. So um, scientists in Australia um, are, are not taught the same way that they're taught in, say, the United States or places like Stanford. Um, CSIRO created two programs, one called ON. ON is the opposite of NO. It's Australia's first science accelerator. It teaches scientists how to take something off the lab bench and get it into either the market or get it into society to solve a real problem. So it connects the science to, to impact. Um, it's not so much about commercialisation as it is about solving real problems with science. For example, um, we saved the lives um, of uh, people in the United States and Europe and Australia by taking um, uh, mineral sands worth pennies per pound, turning them into titanium ink worth thousands of dollars per pound, and then turning them into these life-saving implants, it's a replacement sternum which saved the life of a patient in New York, using science. Um, we did this through the use of typical innovation practices that, say, Mike does in a, in a digital company, but we applied them to science. And I think that's what we're lacking in this country. CSIRO's strategy is all about being Australia's innovation catalyst, about solving our problems using science. I don't want to be alarmist, but that thing's not uh, producing hydrogen now, is it? <laughs> I was just thinking about the Hindenburg. Not uh, yet. Yeah, OK. <laughs> um, time for one last question. It's from Charmaine Spencer. Charmaine. With iTunes announcing the closing of its doors last week, 
What does this mean for music and art ownership? And what are the costs to artists, the consumer, but also the environment by fully adopting the streaming revolution? Uh, Faustina, start with you. I think uh, streaming is absolutely... Uh, the future of streaming was absolutely inevitable and um, iTunes was, a, was bound to die. Um, what this means for the industry... I mean, artists won't get paid a whole lot of money from streaming. An example would be Pharrell's Happy. It was played, I think, streamed 46 million times on Pandora and he only received a cheque of $2,700 for those 46 million streams. Um, so there's a lot of investment in touring um, and, uh, yeah, just live gigs. But That sounds like a massive rip-off of the actual artist. I mean, years ago, if you had a single and it sold 46 million, um, you'd be doing pretty well. Yeah, yeah. It's a sad situation, but uh, that, that's the nature of, of digital these days. Uh, they get a small fraction of, 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 of what the money is. Um, perhaps if you're a big star like Taylor Swift, you can broker better deals, but uh, it seems that the technology is kind of going against you. But the, the wonderful thing about streaming is that it can provide a fertile ground for artists and independent artists to, to rise through the ranks. Ocean Alley is an example of that, uh, a Sydney band that they started in a backyard in northern Sydney, started touring, released an EP, got a lot of streams and then eventually got radio play and then rose to the top. So yes, it's not an ideal situation for artists, but uh, that's the reality that we're facing right now. Adam, what do you think? Yeah, I am an artist and so I do, you know, feel the, the brunt of the digital age because I was like right on the cusp. I used to sell CDs out of the boot of my car hand to hand and now I just got to send people a link. But the idea is, you know, you can't fight technology and the way it moves. And like even now, I think like top 10 um, Billboard, uh, like the top 10 songs of Billboard were cut down to two minutes, 40 seconds. So songs are getting shorter as well. And because it's the way people consume music has changed. Everything's so fast paced. If you go to a club, the DJ will play like a verse and a hook and it's next song. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, you have to be able to adapt to technology like all other industries as well. Like it's, it's a little bit unfair at the moment, but I believe it will adjust and, and change at some point. Um, but, you know, you use that as a promotional tour um, tool to get people to come to your tour and come to your shows. Yeah. How, do you, I mean, how do you actually make money in this environment? Um, Shows. Adam, just so, shows. So live shows. Yeah, it's been really good. And um, like having a good show, good merch. Um, Merchandising. Yeah. Yeah. I'll sell you a T-shirt after. I'm, I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> Out the back of your car? Yeah. Cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Larry, you can't fight technology, I think was the, the phrase that came out of there that stuck in my head. You can't, but, but great science and great technology comes from creativity and we have to nurture and reward creativity. So I think we need to find a way to not rip artists off. We actually have to reward them because how else will they produce the amazing music and poetry, art, the things that actually make us human? Jocelyn. Look, I like to buy a CD. I like to look at the line notes on the CD cover. So yeah. I will continue to do that occasionally, even though I don't um, have... And a... you seem so modern when we first met. I, I know. <laughs> I don't even have a way to play the CD, but I... <laughs> <laughs> I still like that experience, so then I can connect with the music. You really don't have a way to play them. I do, I yeah. do, but you have to Tell connect it into this other doodad, and it's actually quite a problem. But in my car... <laughs> in my car, I do. Um... Yeah, look, uh, I think it's our relationship to music, and but what it does create is a great opportunity then to go to the gigs and be a part of what happens in that live space. And we've got to get out and, you know, foster that in a city which closes down at 9 o'clock. Yes, make a good point. Uh, Mike, um, you can't fight technology again. Um, final word to you, but I guess you'd agree with that. Oh, look, you can't... I mean, you can't, you can't stop technology's progress. You have to, I think, as, as Briggs said, you have to sort of adapt to it. And, and the music industry is a great example, right? It, it's had to do many, many adaptions from 
uh, uh, you know, from the record era through tapes, and everyone was concerned, tapes, everyone was going to rip everything off to CDs, to digital, and then to streaming. And now we've gone all the way back to bandstands in the park. And look, yeah, I mean, the how you make money has changed. Commercialising art, I think, has always been really complicated, mm. and, and, and we always think we should, you know, give creative people more money for their art, but it's, it's, it's been finding the formula, and um, that's really, really hard. Look, the, the streaming industry is a complicated one. The music industry is back, I believe, to being bigger than it was at the height of downloads in like 06, 07. Uh, is that going to the right people? Are the artists getting that, etc.? And are we breaking new artists? But there's the possibility now to go global instantly, which creates many more artists, right? The same, the, the, the Netflix phenomenon we've seen that Aussie shows can now have a global audience instantly through Netflix, which can be great but also means many, many, many more shows, which means, you know, the averages can be different. Um, I don't think you can fight technology, though. Uh, I've just gone uh, over time in our streaming of this program, and that's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel. Larry Marshall, Jocelyn Brewer, Adam Briggs, Mike Cannon-Brooks and Faustina Agoli. Thank you. Thank you very much. And... Special thanks to Vivid Sydney. Now you can continue the discussion with Q&A Extra on News Radio and Facebook Live where Tracy Holmes is joined by former Russian correspondent, now Professor of Journalism, Monica Attard. Next week, a special science show with Q&A, celebrated particle physicist, stargazer and science documentary maker Brian Cox will join us along with marine biologist and president of Science and Technology Australia, Emma Johnston, atmospheric and climate scientist David Caroli, geology professor Martin Van Crankendonk, who's looking for signs of ancient life in Australian rocks, and astrophysicist Wiradjuri woman and science communicator Kirsten Banks. Until then, good night.